I'm not going to have very much to say about this panel because I haven't been overseas uh, on uh, missions like the folks uh, in front of you are. I am looking forward in May to going to both uh, Rwanda and Uganda as a part of uh, one of the Nootbar um, uh, projects uh, in, in, in partnership with Saddleback Church. We do have someone uh, with us. Sure. I was mainly uh, trying to make noise while people quieten down, so. <laughs> so don't, if you couldn't hear what I said, you didn't miss anything. Um, we have um, four wonderful panelists, um, each of whom has uh, a different, uh, very interesting experience from their own attempts as Christians to, uh, to seek justice globally, and we're looking forward to, uh, to hearing from each one of them. I'm going to introduce them very briefly, but, uh, but I want each of them to give us a little bit more detail um, about their work than I'm able to do in the introduction, but I want to reserve as much time as possible for them to talk and for you to be able to uh, talk, uh, to ask questions in our conversation together. Uh, they'll be going in order from um, my left over to, uh, to my right. Uh, the first to speak is going to be Anna Steele. Uh, she is with Delete Freedom Network. Uh, those of you that were able to go to our, our lunch already heard a bit about it, but she's going to give us uh, some more information about it and about her, her own work. Uh, before starting with Delete Freedom Network, um, Anna taught at Harvard University for 10 years. Eight and a half of those years were at the Harvard Law School. Um, she then spent uh, 10 years with international missions, uh, church-related international missions, uh, before joining uh, Dalit Freedom Network. Secondly is going to be Vance Simons. Vance Simons uh, is a lawyer in the Orange County area. He has a variety of experiences. As a lawyer, uh, one time he was with the uh, city of Long Beach, uh, involved in uh, the finance aspects there. He was the city finance director. Um, he's been in law practice with uh, Kasdan Simons uh, since 1993, uh, senior partner of that firm uh, for a time. And uh, he's gonna tell about his um, work with uh, Saddleback's Justice Task Force Third is Sean Litton. Sean uh, practiced with the firm of Kirkland and Ellis before going with International Justice Mission. Um, he's done a variety of things for IJM. He's currently vice president of field operations, but uh, he's also done uh, work at different times in different areas of Asia in their work in rescuing victims of violence and sexual exploitation uh, sexual slavery and, and oppression, and over his time in uh, the Philippines and Thailand, um, and as director of that region, region uh, was involved with the rescue of over 200 women and children from sexual exploitation. Finally, Van Beckwith, um, he's from Watermark Community Church's uh, task force. He's an attorney with a national practice in uh, national trial practice in Dallas, but as a uh, volunteer, works for their justice task force uh, and leads domestic and international efforts. Um, and he'll be giving us more detail on that. So we'll start with, with Anna. I've told the speakers they can uh, speak either from the podium or from, from their seats, and you're going to see them doing a variety of things. So <laughs> Anna, who's going to remain seated. Could I see a show of hands of how many were at the luncheon? Okay, great. Um, that allows me to not have to speak too much about the Dalit Freedom Network, but for those of you that weren't, um, the Dalit Freedom Network is a non-government, non-partisan human rights organization, faith-based, um, established in 2002. And uh, we do have multiple mission core values, seek justice, free the Dalit children, free the Dalit women, um, mobilize the church, kingdom mission. And one of the giant pillars of Dalit Freedom Network is the social justice pillar. 
And so just with that frame, um, I want to also tell you for a moment that the Dalits are history's longest standing oppressed people group. They are absolutely historically also the largest numbers of people categorized as victims of modern day slavery. So you can go all around the world and do all your research and all the reports and you will find that India sits at the top of the list and the children are the most vulnerable. And so the largest democracy on earth has the largest number of bonded slaves on earth. And a lot of them are children. And so part of how I got engaged in this it was March 2005, and I had left Harvard, and I was five years into full-time Christian ministry. I had this unquenchable calling to the church um, about eight and a half years into teaching at Harvard. I was walking to the law school one day, and I said, Lord, I love you so much. Is there something else you want me to do? And I had no idea that the Lord was going to put this unquenchable call into my life to work in the church. And when I was interviewing to work at um, the church, it was the ninth largest church. It is the ninth largest church in the United States. And the pastor said to me, why would anyone leave Harvard to come to work at this church? And I said, it's a promotion. And he said, how can that be? And I said, I used to work for the Lord at Harvard, and now I work for the Lord in his house. How can that not be a promotion? And that was how my journey began, whereby... What this sign says, where law and mission meet. And it was through the structure of the church that I actually became engaged with mission, true kingdom mission that had everything to do with social justice. And it was in March 2005 that I attended a briefing in which Dr. Joseph D'Souza spoke. And I went up to him afterwards and just said, I am horrified. And that horror remains in my heart to this day. And I just, I went to India a year later, and I, uh, we were asked, what do you want God to do for you while you're in India? And I said, I have no idea. But when it came around to me, I just thought, whatever comes out of my mouth, I will say. And what I said at that moment was, I want God to break my heart for India. And God did. I sobbed my way through India. And when Joseph would introduce me to people in India, he said, uh, this is Anna Steele. She's been to India many times in the spirit. This is her first trip in the flesh. And that was true. I had this, so many times my spirit had already um, been indelibly marked by God to care about India and to care about the Dalits. And when I was there in 2006, I had this great opportunity to speak at a rally, a conversion rally, where Dalits were renouncing Hinduism and choosing a different religion. And I was praying that morning, oh, I hope I get to speak, I hope I get to speak. And I mean, I hadn't even started volunteering for DFN, so I have no idea where this was coming from. But at breakfast, Joseph said to me, would you like to speak at the rally today? And I said, oh, yes, thank you. And he said, do you want to speak as someone who taught at Harvard, do you want to speak as someone who's in full-time ministry? And I said, no, I wanted to speak to them as an American whose country was founded on brave people who fought for their religious freedom. And then he said, great, you've got two minutes. <laughs> I had a pen, no paper, and a paper napkin. And I just said, Lord, give me the words. And I just started furiously writing. And when it was my turn to speak, I just got up and spoke whatever the Lord had to say. And I have a feeling that's what's going to happen here today because I have planned and planned and written and thought and thought. And my brain has been into about five different things I could tell you. But when Jay asked me to speak about how does the church seek justice globally, I said, I don't know exactly because I don't work in a church anymore, but I can tell you how Dalit Freedom Network seeks justice in our country on behalf of people who live in another land. And he said, that will be fine. And so um, what I want to tell you today is how we go about doing that in the halls of justice in our own country. But for me, I needed to know that there was a biblical premise for doing this. And so what was most important to me was what did God have to say about justice? And I'm currently the, um, I have this wonderful privilege of working with Joseph and also of 
being the president of, of Dalit Freedom Network today. And the very first day that I became the president, I said to the staff, we will be studying what God has to say about justice. And I did a word search, and I printed out 138 statements of what God had to say from Genesis to Revelation about justice. And they are profound. And I want to read some of them to you today just as a collage, because this is what framed my work in order to get involved with justice. So you can close your eyes, you can keep them open, but it's just going to be sort of a walk through scripture. And by the way, God starts in Genesis, and he is quiet after Colossians. So I will start in the first verse, and I will end in Colossians, and I won't be reading 138 verses. So, <laughs> For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Justice and only justice you shall pursue. He leads the humble in justice. He loves justice and righteousness, for the Lord loves justice. Vindicate the weak and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. How blessed are those who keep justice. The works of his hands are truth and justice. To do righteousness and justice is desired by the Lord more than sacrifice. Evil men do not understand justice. I will make justice the measuring line, saith the Lord. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. He will faithfully bring forth justice. For I, the Lord, love justice. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice. Let justice roll down like water. Thus says the Lord of hosts, dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion. Now will not God bring about justice? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice? And then he ends in Colossians. The last thing he has to say is, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Mm. And so that framed for me, I had to know what God had to say about justice if I was going to get engaged and oversee the social justice department of Dalit Freedom Network. But it was equally important to me to know what our founding fathers had to say, because I am an American, and I do care about what our heritage is regarding justice. If I'm going to be coming before our government on behalf of people in India, what is it that I need to tell our government? We say this. We do this. What are those things? And I remember one day walking around Washington, D.C., and I was going by the Supreme Court um, and there engraved on the wall was justice, the guardian of liberty. And I thought, here it is, Dalit Freedom Network, seeking to bring freedom to the Dalits, but we do it by guarding justice for them. And that was so profound for me, and it really helped also just frame what we would do in Washington. And the other thing that was very key for me was something that Martin Luther King said, and I'll read that to you as well said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So once all of this premise and predicate was established for me, then I needed to know what mechanisms did we have for justice in our country that would allow us to go before our government on behalf of the Dalit people of India. And in this process, it was wonderful to learn that this truly is a government by the people because I'm just a citizen. I am not a lawmaker, I'm a citizen. And I studied, with a whole team studied, um, the four mechanisms of justice. If you will, two will create laws, two will not. There's a bill, there's a simple resolution, there's a uh, concurrent resolution, there's a joint resolution. And for our purposes, we, didn't need, we did not need to make national law. 
So with our, the advice that we received from congressional sponsors was to seek a concurrent resolution. And that was our first act of social justice advocacy on behalf of the Dalit people before the government of the United States. And what you truly need to do is make that decision. If you're going to go out there and start advocating social justice, you need a template and you need to know what you're doing. And once you've chosen which mechanism of justice you you choose to um, implement, you need to find a congressional sponsor because this may be a government by the people, but we need our lawmakers to sponsor what we do. And that can be a very long, dogged process because you need to find a member of Congress and there are 435 of them. And you need to find one who will represent what you feel is truly important that needs to become either law or the sense and opinion of Congress. And for in our case, it was the sense and opinion of Congress that we were going for. So we started in January 2007. By God's grace, we had a congressional sponsor. And um, we began that dogged office-to-office-to-office -to -office -to -office education campaign. And we raised the profile of the Dalits. And we told the story of the Dalits. And usually, I would say 99 out of 100 times, we heard back, what do you need? And my answer was always, we have a legislation pending, would you sponsor it? And here is our, 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 our congressional sponsor, we need co-sponsors. And we received 33 bipartisan co-sponsors for this legislation. And this concurrent resolution is called HCR 139, you can look it up. And it is, expresses the sense of Congress that the United States government should be committed to addressing this ongoing discrimination against the Dalit people called untouchability with India. It was a very, very brief, very to the point. You need to be specific because if, if, if you have so many ideas in one resolution, your resolution is going to end up in several committees. And we were blessed to end up in one committee. The one committee approved it in a day. And then four days later, it was presented for a voice vote on the floor of the House of Representatives, and it passed unanimously. And that was our first giant grace of God victory and advancement for the Dalits. And no matter what happened in Baltimore, they never heard about it. But in India, from Parliament to the village of Well, it rang out that there were people in this country going before our government on behalf of people in India who had no voice. And so that is a template, and you know we can save some things for Q&A, but I'm just going to stop there and just leave you with this, that you can do this. It can be done, and by God's grace, you can see the victories that God is talking about here and in his, in his word. Thanks a lot. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Vance Simons, and I'm here in my role as a member of Saddleback's Justice Task Force. I was going to talk a lot about uh, purpose-driven life, and then uh, Kay covered that. <laughs> and I was going to still, I was going to talk about the peace plan, uh, and Kay covered that. Uh, and then I was going to talk to you a little bit about uh, scripture on justice. And then Anna gave me five of her minutes. <laughs> um, it, sometimes I say to myself, okay, to calm myself before a crowd, I need to imagine you uh, in your underwear. You've heard this, right? <laughs> I'm imagining you all with your crucifixes. It's very calming. Um, it is a, a, just a terrific privilege to be here with you. Um, the people here at Pepperdine, Pepperdine Law, Newt Barr, Newt Bars, uh, Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution. They are just the best people walking around that I know. And uh, it's just a privilege to be here, it truly is. A little brief background on our Justice Task Force. Uh, I know it sounds like a naval convoy. Uh, it's not, it's just a, a, a few individuals, a rotating group of folks who are involved in some fashion with the law, either it's um, delivery in the courts or in public safety. We have uh, people who are family therapists. We have private investigators. We have firemen. 
Uh, we have lawyers and we have judges. Um, uh, what binds us together is that we seek ways to facilitate justice uh, here in this country uh, and abroad. Our focus has been Rwanda due to that peace plan that Kay Warren talked with you about. Um, some of the message I hope you'll get through my talk is that there is wonderful potential for short-term mission trips. If they are planned, if you have partners on the ground, uh, if you go the first time, as was suggested this morning, just with your eyes and your heart open. Uh, if you undertake something like, at Saddleback we have something called the SHAPE Ministry, which asks, what are your spiritual gifts? Where is your heart? Where is your ability? Where is your personality? And where are your experiences? And you ask those questions of yourself seriously and prepare yourself to go and then just open your eyes and ask yourself, what are the problems that I see that I am told about by the churches that I'm visiting with? And now, what are the resources that are at hand, either here in this other country or back home? Uh, and we've been blessed in many ways, and that, that's the focus of what I want to do is talk a little more specifically and concretely about what our Justice Task Force has been up to. And uh, you'll note that uh, as of a year ago, the, the one mission I think specifically we had going relative to Rwanda was something in the area of property grabbing, and I'll explain that, what that's about. And then God moves in his own time. Um, all of a sudden, he put the metal to the floor, and now we have five initiatives that we're involved in. So one message is, don't be discouraged if things go slowly. Uh, he'll, he'll work in his time. And then look out, buckle up. Um, those five initiatives that we're talking about then are, are going to be property grabbing, uh, working on domestic violence and issues of sexual violence, uh, orphans, training and mediation for people who are lay judges, <coughs> and reconciliation training for leaders, particularly pastors, in the country that underwent the, the shocking genocide of 1994. Each of these, you'll note, represents an intersection between Christianity and the law. In much of it, uh, we have experienced a growing partnership with good friends. Um, Pepperdine Strauss, which is ranked as the finest mediation trainers in the world, and IJM, who seems to be everywhere. Um, in each of these, we try to look for some way to make it replicable, make it self-sustaining, let the local people feel they own it, and in fact, get them to own it so that they can take pride in it and keep it going uh, once the, what we call the Mzungos have left, the white people. Um, lawyers have always seemed to be the straight man for Jesus the ones who thrive on conflict, um, those whose perspective might depend too much on who's paying the bill. Our traditional roles are that of advocates, lawmakers, and law enforcers. Uh, this conference begs the question, if we are given the gifts and passions that lead us to the law, what is God's purpose for us in this age? Our mission and setting in Rwanda, I need to flesh that out a little bit for you. Uh, Rwanda's issues are in many ways not unlike those of most of the underdeveloped countries. Uh, AIDS has been an epidemic. It's desperate poverty. The treatment of women and children as chattel. Uh, and they've got problems with the difference. One out of eight people in their country was killed, most of them by machete, uh, a mere 16 years ago. Up close and personal, in the worst kind of way. So you combine these horrible giants, and then you look around and you say, okay, well, what do we got going for us uh, by the time of, say, 2008, uh, which was my first trip to Rwanda? Uh, what we got going for us is a, a kind of an enlightened, educated, forward-thinking, governing class. 
one that adopted a constitution much like ours in 2003. At this point, uh, a parliament that is majority women. Uh, so we have some things going for us. Uh, also, um, what Kay uh, might have mentioned is the purpose-driven training that we have undertaken for pastors. Um, many of you know about the Purpose Driven Life book. Uh, we have developed a three-year course for pastors uh, to be given abroad. Uh, my first trip, uh, we saw 200 of these pastors graduate. Uh, there are another 2,000 pastors in the Purpose Driven Life training pipeline. One of the things that presents for us is a, a system of capillaries. If we want to get word out regarding Christian matters, we have a ready source, ready ears, people who trust us, and uh, it's a responsibility, but it's a, a terrific opportunity as well. When we first went in the first years, uh, we were told this is an assessment trip, so we asked questions. We talked with judges, uh, we talked with lawyers, but most of all, uh, well, when we talked with folks in the Ministry of Justice, and most of all, we talked with pastors. And one of the first things that they said was, our justice problem, perhaps number one, is this thing called property grabbing. And let me explain this to you. And as you think about this, think how foreign this is to our culture. And ask yourself, how do you overcome not just the legal issue, but the heart issue? Uh, property grabbing occurs when a husband in the family dies. And the husband's family members come and seize the land, seize the house, <laughs> seize every stick of personal property, and tell the widow and the fatherless children, take a hike. And it's endemic even now in underdeveloped countries. And it's a, a vicious kind of a thing. And part of it's perpetuated by, hey, it's the cultural thing to do. Uh, part of it is just this desperate poverty, this is the family's opportunity. They may have been the ones who give the land to the, the husband who passed away. So uh, how do we deal with this? Well, in looking around, we found that the widow doesn't have a right unless she has a uh, governmentally recognized marriage. Many of the women in Rwanda think that going to a church, going through the ceremony is enough, that they acquire legal rights as a widow. They're wrong. So astonishingly, uh, one substantial way, and we've been helped in this concept by uh, IJM quite a bit, um, is to simply get the word out there to pastors. Pastors, tell your flock. If you aren't registered with the government, husband, your wife may be put into the street. You have a responsibility biblically. Wives, know that your children may be street children if your husband dies in a country where the average life tenure is in the 40s. Um, so all we need to do is accomplish that registration. Uh, pastors, tell folks, have wedding days at your church. We'll bring the registrar down, and, and this happens. Uh, the belt and suspenders approach is wills. Uh, so part of our training in our Family Guide to uh, Christians in Rwanda is making of wills. We have 10 sample wills. Uh, we'll be, uh, we have focus grouped with some of the pastors there. They're greedy for this information. Uh, they are not afraid of being the lawyers. In Rwanda, uh, the, the del delivery system for justice is lay judges. Much like city council people here, they're unpaid, untrained. Uh, they're doing it for the goodness of their hearts or perhaps for a business motive. But justice, the court of original jurisdiction for 95% of the disputes there, is the Obunzi. And what I'm really thrilled about is another initiative that has developed. And, and that is, uh, we noticed up here, this uh, Strauss group, world class right here, Southern California. Let's talk with these guys. And we threw out the idea that, you know, over in this Rwanda place, there are 32,000 people dishing out the great majority of justice, and they aren't legally trained let alone trained in mediation, your specialty. And yet the Abunzi's charge responsibility is to try to mediate disputes. Of course, the beauty of mediation, we don't go to court per se, we don't ask somebody to render a binding decision, we try to get the parties together and that mends not only the issue, but the relationship. And in villages, that's really important. That's why they have the Abunzi system. So if we could deliver training, wouldn't that be grand? So we toss the idea out to the head of the Abunzi, 
uh, in the Ministry of Justice on our last trip. Uh, by the close of last year, uh, Justice Baca Murera said, guess what, I circulated the idea, we love it. By the end of last year, Strauss wrote back saying, you know, we think we can do this, at least on an experimental basis. And now, uh, Jay and, and Jim came back from Rwanda saying, you know, the government's asked us to develop a three-year program for training and mediation for the mm -hmm. Abunzi. And so that's in discussion stage. Uh, it's contingent, but little short-term trips, they can have huge effect. Um, just a couple words on our other initiatives. Um, one of them is this issue of the genocide. Uh, in talking with some of the officials over there, th they've made wonderful strides. They've developed some mediation themselves, restitution principles right out of Matthew 18. But these things are, are frayed at the edges, and if we talk to some of these folks one-on-one, -on -one, we hear genocide kinds of things in Rwanda is coming again. It's not an if, it's a when. And so there's another problem. What kind of solution can we, the Mazungos, bring? Well, reconciliation, training of pastors in methods of reconciliation. Uh, that's purely Christian. It's something that we can help with, come alongside with. It's replicable if we train people to be trainers. Uh, we're also taught, we also began uh, an orphans uh, initiative. Uh, Jeff LaPere over here, uh, Jeff, where are you? Uh, is a trained lawyer in international rights. Uh, we're gonna be looking at legislation. Uh, why aren't there more adoptions? Because the solution to orphans is not orphanages, it's families. And one of our own staff members at Saddleback tried to adopt out of Rwanda, encountered all kinds of obstacles, uh, even though her boss knows President Paul Kagame of Rwanda personally. Uh, so international and domestic adoptions, we're looking at legislation there to try to help smooth some of the rough spots that are tripping up people who want to adopt. Orphanage, orphans are a huge problem, given HIV, given the genocide, given malaria and the water problems. There are street children everywhere, and it's going to doom the country if something isn't done about it. Um, I should probably wrap up. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll just tell you, one of the fun things that happened on uh, my first trip there, uh, we were driving down to the law school to meet with um, uh, some folks about the property grabbing issue, just understanding the succession laws, because it's a real patchwork of laws. And we just walked in on a group of folks um, who happened to have been asked by the Rwanda government to develop property law. So, okay, we found the right place. We, we walked in on it. Um, and at first, they, uh, the leader, the professor of law, a nun, said, gosh, I wish you'd um, have come another time. Um, yeah, but we can give you 15 minutes. Uh, three hours later, she said, um, thank you for coming. You have asked some questions that we had not considered that are really important. Now, on the trip back to Kigali, uh, we drove through a village, and we saw somebody with very distinctive books with purple colors. And it was a purpose-driven life. We, we could spot it a mile away. And uh, we stopped, and the, the guy was selling purpose-driven life from Rick Warren. Two days later, we were at an orphanage, and uh, the lady who was second in command at the orphanage, she's toting another purple book. But folks, I understand that uh, God is ubiquitous. He, he is everywhere. But I submit that Rick Warren may be running second. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, we need to pray for Jim Martin, who's running my PowerPoint, and the odds of me sticking to the outline are one in seven. Um, I'm Sean Litton. I uh, work for International Justice Mission, Professor Cochran. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Snoopbar, thank you. And I want to thank this school. I will say about the school and the people that I've met in the time that I've been here and in my previous conversations with them that there's something very special going on here. And uh, I would call it Jesus. And uh, um, I'll leave it at that. And it's wonderful, and I can actually smell it. Like, I can see it, and I can feel it in the people, and I love it. So thank you. Okay. Now, since we're at a law school, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about a conversation Jesus had with a lawyer. And Vance uh, referred to it. Uh, Mark Laberton re referred to it. Uh, one of the other panelists referred to it. And it's in Luke chapter 10. You don't need a Bible, but if you have one, you probably know it by heart. It's this 
lawyer who approaches Jesus and says, <clears throat> excuse me, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers with his own question, well, what, is the, what does the law say? How do you read it? And uh, the lawyer responds uh, with this, this great uh, statement of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and strength and mind, excuse me, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, well, you have answered correctly. The lawyer got the answer right. And then Jesus says this thing, and this is critical. Do this and you will live. So even though the, answer got, the lawyer got the answer right, you see him, all of a sudden he's uncomfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. He's uncomfortable with Jesus' response. He's particularly uncomfortable with this part of the response. Do this and you will live. So this is a lawyer, right? He cannot deny the validity of the command. It was his answer. So what does a good lawyer do when he cannot deny the validity of the law? He seeks to limit the application of the law. Okay. <laughs> So he moves to limit the scope of the application, and he asks Jesus then one of the greatest questions that's ever been asked in human history, and it's come out all over the panel today. I'm so glad nobody else got to it so that I could do it. And, and he asks him, well, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Jesus, who is the person that I'm to love as myself? And Jesus responds with the story of the Good Samaritan, right? This story, you'll remember, a man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he is attacked by robbers. Okay, he is beaten. He is robbed. He is stripped, stripped naked, and he is left for dead at the side of the road. He is dying. He's sitting there. The man is broken, and he's all alone. He is unable to help himself. If no one comes to help him, he will die. He's all alone. His family and friends are not there. Someone else will have to help him. This is the man that Jesus describes in response to the question, who is my neighbor? As P Professor Cochran said when he introduced me, I work for International Justice Mission, and we are a collection of lawyers and social workers and criminal investigators who work on crimes of violent injustice, okay? And we're there to accomplish four things in these cases. First of all, urgent relief for the victims of crime. Okay, to stop the abuse. Most of our clients, when we encounter them, they are being abused, violently abused. It's slavery, it's rape, it's illegal detention, it's torture. The second thing that we're trying to do is bring the perpetrators of this, these abuses to account. So we work with the government, with the police, with the courts to bring them to account for what they've done, to see that the law that is on the books is actually enforced, that it is made real. The third thing that we do is victim aftercare, and that is to provide care to the victims of the abuse, the, the people that survive, for rehabilitation, and also to reduce their vulnerability to further abuse. And the last thing that we work on is systemic reform, structural transformation, and that is to create, to ensure that the public justice system actually works, that it protects the poor. There are laws on the books that prevent Everything that we work on at International Justice Mission, everything that we work on is a crime under the law. Nevertheless, it happens with impunity. And that's a word we haven't heard today, but that's an important word. Impunity, that, that is when there is no protection under the law and people can ignore it without any threat of sanction. Now, when I, when I think of that, na that neighbor, the man by the side of the road, the man that Jesus described as our neighbor, He's a victim of violent crime. And he reminds me of many of the people that I've met in my work with IGM. I want to talk to you just about a few of them in the brief time I have. First of all, Shanti. Shanti is a slave in a rice mill in India. Like millions of other lower caste Indians, her owner considers her his property, and she cannot leave. We heard Mr. D'Souza talk about this earlier today. She tried to leave once. But when the mill owner found out she had left, he sent some of his men to find her. They tracked her down, they beat her, and they brought her back. Shanti and her family have been enslaved in this rice mill for 15 years. All of this is against the law in India, but her owner has power. 
He has standing in the community. He has the physical strength, the paid enforcers, the privileged caste, and the financial resources to take from Shanti whatever he wants. And Shanti's suffering is not limited to her own, her own abuse. No, like so many other slaves over the course of history, she watches helplessly as the yoke of slavery slips seamlessly from her shoulders onto the very shoulders of her children. Even when the owner of the rice mill began, began sexually abusing her 13-year-old daughter, she was helpless to do anything about it. When she confronted him, he said this to her, and what caste are you? There was nothing she could do. Another man I think of when I think of this neighbor, this man lying by the side of the road, is a man named Job. I met him in Nairobi, Kenya. Job and his wife, Karis, live in Nairobi, <clears throat> and they have a daughter named Charity. Last summer, she was coming home from school. She's a third grader. And a former neighbor was waiting there. He gave her younger brothers and sisters some money to go buy some candy, and he went into the house with Charity, and he attempted to rape her. Fortunately, Charity's mother came home early from work that day. She stopped him. She interrupted him before he could complete the crime. When Job came home, he learned what had happened like any other father. He was outraged, and he went to the police to file a claim. The police refused to do anything. They told Job, no, you go and work out a financial settlement with this neighbor. <clears throat> he persisted, and he demanded that they do as the law required that they arrest the man who attempted to rape his third grade daughter. Again, they refused. But Job didn't give up. He left that police station, and later that week, he went to a police station in a neighboring village. He gave them, again, all the evidence that he had given the first police officers, and these officers did the right thing. They went and arrested the neighbor but they had to transfer him to the original police station, the police station in Job's village. And when the neighbor was transferred to that station where he had originally filed his complaint, the officers called him in. They told him, knock it off. We told you not to do this. Now, you work it out with him. We're going to let him go. And Job said, no. And then the captain said, I will show you who has the power. And they put Job under arrest. They took him to a cell, and they beat him. They beat him to the point he had to be hospitalized. And they arrested him for filing a false complaint, and they let the neighbor go. Now, these are the people that come to my mind when I think about this man lying by the side of the road, this man who Jesus says is our neighbor, who we are called to love. They are beaten. They are abused. They were without help. And like millions and millions of men, women, and children living in the developing world, they live without the protection of law. They have no one to help them, and their oppressor has all the power. And so what are we, the church, we, the church, to do about this? For guidance, I want to go back to this parable, back to this story. Remember, Jesus describes three travelers that came upon the man by the side of the road. The first two, the religious people, right? What do they do? They see the man. They approach the precipice that Kay talked about earlier today. And what do they do? They run away from that precipice. The Bible says they go to the other side of the road and continue along their way. They move as far away from the chaos and disorder of that situation as they can, and they go about their agenda. But then a Samaritan comes. What does he do when he approaches the precipice, when he looks and sees the disorder and the chaos represented by this man? He goes to him. He leaves the road, and he goes to him. He draws near to him. He moves toward the hurt, toward the pain, toward the the suffering. He treats the man's wounds. He puts him on his own donkey. He takes him to the inn. He pays for his care, and he tells the innkeeper to continue to care for him and that he will pay whatever is needed when he returns. This is the kind of worship that Mark Laberton was talking about. Like, this is a picture of the worship that Mark Laberton was talking about this morning. The Samaritan takes what he has. He leaves the road and he responds to the need. 
And this is the thing I love about this parable. The lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? But Jesus goes so far beyond this question. Jesus is describing what it looks like to love your neighbor. Not just who is my neighbor, but what does loving your neighbor look like? Jesus paints the picture of love. Self-sacrificing, self-emptying love. The love that is at the very heart of the gospel. The love that Jesus himself demonstrated for us, for you and I, when he died on the cross for our sins. Jesus is showing that redemption comes at a cost, but love pays the cost. I want to return now to the people that I introduced you to earlier. And I want to tell you what happened when my colleagues at International Justice Mission left the road and got involved in their situations. Shanti. Shanti is no longer trapped in slavery. Her daughter is safe. Last year, IJM investigators conducting an undercover operation located them. IJM lawyers took this information to the local authorities, and after a period of advocacy, they mobilized those authorities to rescue Shanti and several other men, women, and children who were kept in that mill and had been brutalized for years. IGM lawyers successfully advocated with the authorities to provide them all release certificates, which are statements by the Indian government that these people are free now and for all time. And this, these certificates entitle them to a host of benefits that the government will provide, including land and money to make that land productive. And, and after a pitched battle in the courts, they forced the police to open an investigation into the rice mill owner. Okay? And that investigation is ongoing, and we will fight and we will fight until he's charged, both with the slavery and the sexual abuse. And Job, the man who wanted justice for his daughter, he's no longer in jail. IJM Kenya took Job's case and secured the dismissal of all charges against him. They are pushing the police to do now the right thing to investigate the original uh, sexual assault claim and, and arrest the suspect. In addition to that, they're going before the Attorney General to have those police officers who beat him, who tortured him, who threw him into jail, brought to justice. That will be a battle. But this is what love looks like, and this is how redemption happens. Shanti is free, her daughter is safe. Job is back with his family, his daughter is safe. And this is the number one thing that I've learned in almost 10 years that I've served with International Justice Mission. As you move away from yourself, from your own agenda, from your own comfort, from your own control, and you move towards the hurt and the pain and the suffering in the world, I have found that God is real. Absolutely, 100% real. And the things that I have read in the Bible are true. 100% absolutely true. But I only know this, okay, because I left a place of comfort and security and I got involved. What did Mr. Lee said? God moves as you show up. Ten years ago, I went to Manila to open the office there for IJM. We were a baby organization. We didn't even have email addresses. They gave me a laptop computer, an ATM card, and a one-page mission memo, and they sent me to Manila. I got one phone call the first year I was in the Philippines. I'd never been to Asia before, and I didn't want to go. <laughs> okay? That's 10 years ago. Two weeks ago, I was back in Manila. The, the reason I went to Manila is I thought, well, if we can just rescue one girl. If we can just rescue one girl, it'll all be worth it. All the perceived sacrifice, whatever, my parents' concern. Two weeks ago, I was back there. Okay, two weeks I was back there to visit, okay, the 59 Filipino staff that are doing justice in the Philippines and the 127 women and girls that they rescued last year from sex, sexual slavery, okay? And some of the 100 children they are currently representing in court who have been sexually assaulted. God is real. He's on the move. Redemption comes at a cost, but love pays the cost. Thank you.
So my name is Clint Eastwood. That's what it would have to be to uh, follow that. Um, <laughs> my name is Van Beckwith. I'm from Dallas, Texas. And I would have to juggle, blow fire, or something to keep you awake as the last speaker at this great day. <laughs> uh, and, and after following that uh, talk, I will tell you, uh, my favorite Christmas present this past year was a picture of Job's family. So mm. it hangs in our house, and it's fun to be able to tell my 13-year-old uh, daughter and my 17-year-old son about Job and the work of IJM. But uh, let me tell you just a little bit about uh, Watermark Community Church, the church I call home, the church I call family, the church that holds me accountable, the church that holds me in community, uh, calls me down from my sins and challenges me to come to places like Pepperdine when I ought to be working at my law firm. But uh, the... Uh, it's a church, uh, and I really hesitate at, uh, at 4.30 in the afternoon to talk about I and me and we. I don't tell you this for accolade. I really don't. I do it to tell you about some context because I'm going to give you five real quick points, and then I'm going to sit down. Uh, I don't want to talk about I, me, and we because I want to proclaim Christ as much as Sean and the rest of the panelists have proclaimed Christ. Uh, through a band of about 160 now lawyers, uh, uh, justice professionals, mediators, judges, social workers at Watermark, we've been able to uh, really, I think, have a little bit of an impact in a couple of places. In West Dallas, the 11th poorest community in America, uh, and then in Goma, Congo, and Bujumbura, Burundi, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Uh, collaboratively with other churches in town, also really trying to rally lawyers, rally lawyers away, frankly, from bar associations where uh, they are given plaques and pictures and told how great they are, and instead rally lawyers to take action. The, uh, here, here are three simple takeaways as we close, or at least as this panel closes. Number one, you can do this. You really can do this. In fact, I think you have to do this if you are a follower of Christ. For the law students, and I really, uh, it's exciting, I, I asked somebody last night, I said, well, what kind of folks are going to be there? And the answer was, you know, there'd be a lot of law students, and that got me excited because, guess what, young lawyers can have a huge impact here. I think there was a young lawyer up here who asked the question about, well, what do I do if my church uh, doesn't want to do this? Uh, well, what you do is you, you find a group of friends, you start living in community with them, and then you lead out in your church. And you start looking for more lawyers in your church and judges and other professionals who can speak to this issue. You start getting them together and you start doing something. And frankly, if your church doesn't like that, find a new church. <laughs> I wanted to show you this picture real quick because these are some of my heroes. Uh, these, are, these are people whose lives have changed. I love what Kay Warren said. She said something like, you know, if you follow this, it'll start to wreck your life. Well, let me tell you about some of my friends. Uh, the tall guy in there in the middle is Rick Howard. Rick uh, has made six trips now to Africa. He's dressed up there in Goma, Congo. I'm going to tell you about Goma in a second. Rick uh, downsized his family. His three boys now all live in one bedroom so that Rick has more time to go to Goma because he frankly is in love with the men uh, there in that picture and wants to share life with them. Uh, Mary Bertelbo is way in the back. Mary uh, works at a large law firm, but she went and told that law firm that she would only work part-time because the other times in the year she wanted to be in Africa. And she's made about 15 trips now on her own nickel. Uh, Sharon Machalka in the back has made about five trips. She has a real passion for teaching women about the law over there. And what you find over there is about 50% of the lawyers are women. And so it's a great opportunity for young women lawyers to go over there and shepherd and love and care for other women lawyers. Cindy Springer, a, a district attorney in Dallas, Texas, uh, who does the same, gives of her time and her talents and her treasures to go hang out in Africa. Scott Breedloaf is a uh, very successful big firm partner, intellectual property uh, trial lawyer, tries patent cases for a living, and uh, just brought home three Ethiopian children to his house, raising his child total to six. So those are some of my heroes. Uh, second thing, I love what Kay Warren said. It's exactly what I was going to say. You've heard it today. 
before you run off, no offense, Sean, before you run off and sign up for an NGO, why don't you try this in your church? We still believe at Watermark that Jesus Christ's plan for the world is the local church done right. We absolutely believe that. And so there's plenty of places for NGOs in the world, and, and places like Goma Congo would probably cease to exist without them, but your church, through your leadership, not your pastors, you are the pastor, through your leadership, can make a huge difference in the world. So where do you start? You start with trying to change the lawyers' hearts inside your church, getting to know them one by one, building into them. Third takeaway, we really believe in relying on trusted partners. We don't try to go cowboy up and do this by ourselves. So if we go somewhere, we go first and foremost, we go with our trusted partner alarm, African Leadership and Reconciliation Mission. You can go look it up on the web. It is founded by a survivor of the Rwandan genocide, and its whole goal is to train Africans to solve Africa's problems. So that's where we go. We go locked arms with them. And that's kind of really the beginning of my story. In March 2007, I was invited to go train on leadership and conflict resolution in Goma, Congo. I'm sure you've heard of Goma. That is where Hillary was very recently. That's where Matt Damon goes. That's where they all go. But in March 2007, there really weren't that many people going there, and Celeste and Musakura of Alarm wanted us to go because we had been through some conflict. To answer your question, we had been sued by a church member, uh, so we had really perfected our conflict resolution <laughs> curriculum. <laughs> we had learned a lot about ecclesiastical abstention, and, uh, and then on top of that, uh, we had really spent a lot of time thinking about leadership and, and Christ's Christ's view of how do you lead yourself, how do you lead others, and how do you lead organizations. And Celestin had asked us to go to Goma, and I was asked to go. And I really kind of scratched my head because I'm, I'm a lawyer, and so I'm a skeptic at heart, right? And so I said, well, what in the world am I going to do in Goma, Congo for 10 days? And then I went on the UN website, and I realized I really didn't have any business going there because there were 17,000 UN peacekeeping troops trying to keep people from dying there. <laughs> and at the time, I had a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old, and I needed to be a dad. But I went on one condition. Uh, the condition was, <laughs> the condition was uh, really me scratching my head some more saying, why is this the place of the largest rape crisis in the world there's got to be some Christians there. And there's got to be probably some Christian lawyers there. And so I will go if we can buy dinner for the Christian lawyers. And so we brought about 30 Christian lawyers together. These are some of them right here. And this is how they make you dress up when you go to court with them. <laughs> but we, we went. And that was the first time in the history of Goma, Congo, that Christian lawyers had sat around a table and started to self-identify as Christians. Because before then, they had been Baptists and Pentecostals and Episcopalians and Lord knows what else, and they had never connected the dots that they were also Christians. We've been back six times, we've built into them and uh, are busy trying to love on them. So they've taken us to some, some pretty crazy places. And two last points. When you get taken to crazy places like this, this is an IDP camp in Goma, Congo. This is where people live. The only beauty to uh, living in an IDP camp in Goma, Congo is that there was a giant volcano there. And so there's a good chance you can actually build your mud hut on top of about two feet of lava and have a built-in foundation. But that's about it. And then when the bad guys in the jungle start getting really hot, that IDP camp turns into about, you know, quadruple what you see there. But when you go, and you will go, I want you to do two, two last things. Number one, or number four, stay focused. Stay focused and challenge the locals to lead in community with each other. Don't ask them to go Rambo it by themselves. Ask them to have trusted friends who they can work with 
who they can bounce their ideas off of, who they can be told that some of their ideas are crazy, but build them community in them. Because when, if you build community in them, you're going to come back and you're going to find that they're still living in that community. They may not have advanced the ball very far, but they will be living in community. And we've got some in the picture before. We, I can tell you about Didi, Elaine, Guy, Sabra, all of them who are working together. They take us places like this. This is the jail in Goma, Congo. In Goma and jail, here's what happens. Uh, you don't get fed. And so uh, in exchange for money, in exchange for other things, your relatives can pass food through to you. And yes, a bunch of, what was it, uh, overweight short guys, white guys in shorts can actually go into the prison and, and meet these people. But there are no cells in there. There are no cells. I mean, it's just one big room full of about 200 people, many of whom have been charged with crimes and have never had a fair trial. So that's why you have to rely on the locals, because guess what? You do have to come home and raise a family. You do have to come home and do some of these things. And so what you want to do is build into the locals. And last, I'll close with this. As you get all fired up and go off to your churches and do some great things, and I know you will, replicate leadership. Do not hold on to this. Do not. Don't elect yourself the president of the lawyers group at your church. Don't. Replicate leadership. Give it away. Train others. Take younger and younger lawyers with you. And so next week we fly off to Goma, Congo, where we'll be hanging out with some of our friends. And we're going to be taking a law student from SMU Law School, Lisa Lopez. We're going to be taking Russ Brown, about a fifth-year lawyer in Dallas, with us as we go and train on try to, how you heal from sexual trauma, working with another close partner, Heal Africa. We've invited IJM to join us. I think they will. But the key is to replicate leadership. I hope it's been helpful. Well, thanks to all of our panelists. And now we have an opportunity for you to raise some of the questions that have come to your mind as these folks have been talking. The question is, how do you get uh, task forces going in, uh, in churches? I'm repeating the question for the sake of the, uh, the tape, which, which, by the way, will be up on the uh, Newt Bar website in about three weeks. So those of you who have friends and you're just sitting there, boy, I wish they'd been here and could have heard this, they'll get a chance in about, uh, about three weeks. So, Vance? Um, and let's see, we'll need to... Let me... Uh confess that I wasn't there, uh, but I have somebody in the audience. Stan, are you here? Stan? I think Stan might have left. But I can take it. Over there? Go for it. Right? Okay. You want me to just take? You, I can yeah, let's dive just, in. Let's just have Vanny uh, uh, answer so this one. I, I would start really small. Uh, start small. Find one other like-minded person who is a lawyer or a law professional and uh, really start to pursue something together. So, and, then, and then try to widen the circle. So go to three, go to four, go to five. Then pick a place. I wouldn't try to go to five different places over five different years. Pick a place. It may be inner city Los Angeles. If that's where you're focused, it may be somewhere on the other side of the world. And then look for a partner. Uh, look for a partner that you can trust, that you can rely upon, that is there, that is uh, engaged. And really, I mean, the bottom line is to trust Christ. We didn't start off trying to do this by any means. We, we started off uh, really quite by uh, God's providence. So that's why you have to trust and really pray that God would lead you to a place. Vance? Can I just uh, supplement that briefly? Um, at our church, uh, we have cards in the seat in front of us, and our pastor asked us... Uh, you folks who might be interested in this peace plan, do me a favor, check off the box and give us your profession. And so that was sifted. We have a, a marvelous uh, computer help and bang, we had a list of 150 lawyers who were interested in peace. 
And uh, that was certainly a help and a sustaining help because uh, every once in a while you want to do that just to refresh that list. Good. Next question. Good. A film student asks how filmmakers might help with these tasks. Can I start with that? Uh, I'm looking for somebody to go with us in May. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as so many of us have said today, what this is about is uh, training people who will be trainers. And we can only go over there so much. Uh, so we're hoping that in things like training on uh, property grabbing issues, on reconciliation issues, um, on all kinds of issues that we can bring, we want to leave it in a format that the government or the local IGM or whomever can pick up and continue that training. So. Glad you're here. Let's see, another question here. Okay, the question is how does India get away with, or how do these things go on in, uh, in India, a, a democracy, as Anna said earlier? That's a great question. India is the largest democracy in the world. Their democracy is quite different than ours. And one of the things about India is that all of the laws are made at the central government level. And when we were drafting our third piece of legislation, um, dis addressing the human trafficking crisis, which is against the law in India, I had three pages of whereases, whereas this law was passed, whereas India signed that convention, that protocol, three and a half pages of law. But the law is made at the central government level in India, and it is ratified and applied at the state level. The states have much more power than we understand in our own democracy, and therein lies the gap. So that unless the states are changing, then we are going to see this crisis continue. And in 2006, the India Human Rights Commission uh, issued its annual report. And in that report, it said that the largest perpetrators of violence against the Dalit people are the law enforcement, police officers, and government officials at the state and local level. That's why we have this problem. Let me ask a follow-up question, and I'll direct this one to, uh, to, to Sean, who works with IJM, because I know IJM runs into this problem all over the world, that uh, countries often will have laws that just are not enforced, and maybe he could uh, comment on the, uh, the, the breadth of that, that problem and how they get a, get a state or attempt to get a state to enforce the laws that they do have. I think that problem is one of the biggest problems in the entire world, to be honest with you. And I think it's one of the, um, the great gaps in terms of as, 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 uh, at the macro level as we engage with countries uh, for economic development, for improvement of the lives of the people there, that it's often ignored. Um, the issue, uh, they can point to laws on the books, like in India, slavery is against the law, bonded labor is against the law. Um, and it's only been recently that attention is being paid to whether the law is actually enforced. So how to, how to attack that problem? Well, first of all, it's a big problem, so you need big resources, to be honest with you. It's, uh, it's, it's macro reform, and uh, it, it's, it involves the police, it involves the prosecution, it involves the courts. And, um, and there, the police... Um, in most places in the world, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here, the police are seen as a threat, not as a source of security. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that, and you know, the police compete to be placed in the districts where the most vulnerable people are. Why is that? Because they're the easiest ones to exploit. And so, uh, but very little has been done to address these types of problems. And uh, there's a, a law student here, Emily Smith, and, and we, we're doing a bunch of research trying to write an article just as this uh, deals with um, uh, girl children and, and the gap in the, people all talk about the girl problem, the girl child problem, the girl child problem, that's where the best place to invest uh, you know, development dollars. But nobody's addressing the fact that they're, they're being raped and abused and imprisoned with impunity. Okay, so 
What's the point of educating a girl when 30 to 40 percent of them are being raped by the time they're 14 years old in places like Uganda? Okay? And that's a known statistic. Thank you. Sorry. And can I punctuate something there too? A, a word of hope. It is impactful if foreign governments pass laws that India becomes aware of. Because when, if you, for example, six months before our resolution was passed, the U European Union Parliament passed a resolution as well addressing the practice of untouchability. If you look back to the example of South Africa, how was apartheid dismantled? Nelson Mandela and his people working so assiduously from within, but also the international community is putting the squeeze on South Africa. India is easily shamed by other governments being concerned about what's going on there. So in a very diplomatic, but also strong and firm way, this can be changed. And in fact, the discourse coming out of India today at the central government level is that all stakeholders, from Supreme Court justices, the number one social problem in India is human trafficking. Home Secretary, 100 million people are involved in human trafficking by his estimates. That's perpetrators and victims combined. Another Supreme Court justice, but it must be handled with a stern and iron hand by all stakeholders. It's permission to proceed. Another question, yes. Yes, I'll re repeat the question. How do we keep uh, justice issues of the sort that we've been talking out today about today from being just a Caucasian issue? It's mostly a uh, you know white uh, white 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 audiences that uh, that are addressing it. How do we engage our brothers and sisters uh, um, across the board? Uh, for our organization, um, the majority of our staff are overseas. 97% of those staff are nationals of their country. So um, to me, I don't, I don't see that. In other words, because all the time I'm with Cambodians or Filipinos or Indians, and they're fire-breathing, justice-eating dragons, you know? And so, um, and, and I mean, I, you know, there's a woman named Pranitha in India, you know, when the mob had formed and outside the brick kiln where they were there to rescue uh, the slaves and, and the police wouldn't move and they were gonna, they were telling our staff to leave and, and Pranitha is with the laborers that were trying to rescue and they're like, no, you have to leave all the IJM staff out. She's like, no, I won't leave them. I mean, this is John 10.10, right? The good shepherd does not run away when the wolf comes. Now, there was nobody Caucasian saying, you know, they were saying, Pranitha, get out, you know, but they weren't saying that. But, um, but the idea is that, you know, people, everywhere that I've gone, um, I haven't, it, we haven't had any problem finding people. When I, when I went to the Philippines, the church there is passionately aware of justice issues. I mean, you had people power, you had people power too, you know, you've had these, these movements. Um, they're mu in, my, in my experience, in many cases, much more in tune to God's heart for justice and the, and the issue of justice than I ever found anywhere in the American church. Yes? The question is, is there a place for interfaith work um, in this area, and is there, is there work going on? Uh, Sean? Uh, okay, so the way that IJM set up, we're a Christian organization. We only hire Christians, okay? And so all of our staff are Christian. At the same time, we partner with uh, one of our four organizational values is bridge building, and we build bridges with people from different faiths, different backgrounds, different, you know, different agendas around core issues. But in terms of the countries that you mentioned in the Middle East, so to speak, we don't have any projects moving forward there at this time. I can speak to it a little bit. Okay. Uh, in the case of Rwanda, uh, our peace plan went to Rwanda and actively uh, engaged uh, all the faiths we could um, and we've largely uh, got uh, most of the Protestant faiths actively working with us. We have something we call the Steering Committee, uh, which are basically the heads of various denominations that we routinely communicate with, ask their uh, uh, support and advice. And this is particularly important such that the 
pastors themselves who are working with uh, in the villages. They know they've got the backing of the heads of their churches. Uh, and so it, it's a good format, I think, for working with uh, and leveraging more communication with various faiths and gets them talking with each other. I can't say that we've been universally successful in getting all the denominations to, to uh, dialogue on the steering committee or to work with each other, but we've, we've made pretty good progress. But thanks, uh, let's thank, thank our panel again.